So we've seen all the available episodes of My Hero Academia, and there's already a hole in my life. I already feel at a loss for where I'm going to draw my plus ultra inspiration. It really was a powerful show for me in the way I conceptualize my life and the way I think about life, specifically in terms of how I channel my energy and how I process difficulty. It was an amazing experience because I, I really did not have any expectations of the show besides it having heroes, and it definitely delivered on that front, but also it delivered in so many ways I never expected. As is often the case with these shows, I found myself reflecting on the characters even when I wasn't making videos, just in my daily life, you know. As conflict and problems arose, it felt not only more manageable to think about Deku and other characters, but also they became something of value. They became an opportunity, you know, it became an opportunity to rise to the challenge and let it be something that feels exciting and it feels good. So I'm going to miss having the show as sort of a regular part of my routine. But we got the Q&A, so it's time to answer some questions, plus Ultra Style. Benja asks, does Invisible Girl even deserve to breathe? No. So I was notoriously hard on Invisible Girl, and it all started from that comment she made about Kirishima, sort of writing him off because of his room. But it's all love, like, she's fine. I actually think, or maybe hope, that this creates an opportunity. Invisible Girl coming through and doing something amazing would be such an incredible turnaround for what she's been for most of the show, which is sort of there, or not there, as it often feels. It's almost a cruel joke from the show itself to even ask her to be a distraction, because she's so easy to ignore. But she could turn it around, especially now that she has team attacks that have formed with, like, Ayama. Machi Mozzarella asks, who's your all-time favorite my Hero Academia character. Difficult. This might come as a surprise. It's tough not to go with the obvious choice and just say Deku because that's where I think a lot of the inspiration in the show comes directly from. It's him and his journey and the strength he exhibits. But if I think about the joy I feel when they're on screen, it's not him actually. It would be Mirio. I think some of my favorite moments of the show have been Mirio based, like his fight against Overhaul. There's something I desperately wish I could capture in myself that's in Mirio. A lot of characters have similar elements to him where he's gonna rise to the challenge. He's gonna be great. He's gonna be a hero. He's gonna have a smile on his face. He's gonna fight to the end. But then there's another thing that he has that I feel is extra special and sort of takes it to another level, and that's his body. Awesome bod. But also, he's able to do all that and rise to the same challenges other people rise to, but with this sort of perfection of demeanor, if that makes sense, where he's so connected to who he is, he's so focused on his tasks and his vision, that the world is sort of a delight to him. He feels a little bit less burdened by other things than some of the characters do. That desire to rise and to match his personal vision of himself comes sort of without the fear I think a lot of other characters have, where there's this fear of failure, there's this fear of not meeting their ideal. I mean, it's just his life. Like, he just lives as who he is. He's sort of this already realized character in a way. So much so that even when he lost his power, while he definitely grieved for that, he was more or less the same very quickly. And I think that's just because his heroism, like a lot of the characters in the show, it's not really about his ability. The ability is sort of just a reflection of that. There's a purity there that I really like that, you know, I think can be easy to dismiss. It's like, oh, he's just a happy guy or whatever. But I think it's actually more than that. I think it's a sign of really high intelligence, or at least a certain kind of intelligence, because, you know, he's kind of a goofball. Where there's so much clarity and so much extra emotional space for him that he can be just great and cheerful, if that makes sense. Also, what are your predictions for season six without getting into any spoilers? Firstly, let me just say I think that All Might's comment about Deku needing to learn float is very timely. It's sort of like, gee, I wonder why he'd want to avoid touching the ground. You know what I mean? That makes me think float and confrontation with Shigaraki and just full on war, I'm guessing. My expectation and also a great fear is that I feel like for the first time we're going to lose characters that have been around since the beginning. We've lost some heroes, right? We lost uh, Night Eye, but I have the distinct sense after watching the end of season five that this one's going to cut a little deeper. I think Aizawa's fears are going to be validated that they're not ready. They've been through some stuff but at the same time the kids much like the audience i think are not prepared for what the villains have been doing and what they're willing to do there's this joke of my villain academia in a way the villains or specifically shigaraki has gone farther in terms of powers at least than the students have also some random things i'm expecting more team attacks i think that's starting to be established more and more you might even get a harry potter type thing where classes are canceled and school's suspended for a while because there's just more at stake. The world's, you know, falling apart. I also predict that at some point in the season, Ida will move his hands wildly. Uraraka will find a way to kill people and Ayama will not stop twinkling. Kevin Beaver asks, what do you think of Deku as a protagonist? It's very interesting for me to reflect on the poll for, you know, when this show was chosen and reading the comments, I remember one of the common things I heard about Deku was that he was a crybaby. And it's sort of funny to me because, you know, he does have emotional moments and he does cry, but I feel like in a key way, he's sort of the opposite of a crybaby, at least in terms of that feeling of like being helpless and being sort of pitiful and being immature or, you know, whatever it is. I actually think he's in a really compelling way, a very strong character. 
after. There's this weird thing about Dick, but they, you know, almost could be a chip on his shoulder if he would let that be a thing, where a lot of his success comes from what seems like luck, you know, right place, right time, All Might being there. But actually, I think that even with no All Might, Deku grows up to be something great. I think one of the larger points of the show is that it's not the powers that make you a hero, right? And that's part of what makes it so relatable and so useful for life. And I think Deku already had that because he was he was thinking about what that meant and he was reflecting on what that meant for him and was very clear that that's what he wanted to be. And so I actually think it's no coincidence that All Might gives him his powers because people like that are destined for greatness. And he created his own greatness. It just took the form of All Might giving him powers. He was rightly recognized by All Might for being exactly that. And so in a way, he rose to that level through merit. But in a nutshell, I love Deku. I mean, he's a tremendous point of inspiration for me. Watching him sort of dig deep, you know, finding that extra layer, that extra power, that's not random or a plot device. It's connected very deeply to things he has learned and a vision of self that was always defined but continues to get more refined as time goes on. Alex Williams asks, what do you think about the character's goals, strengths, and weaknesses and what they need to improve? So back to Deku, I would say, this hasn't really come up in a major way in the show, I don't think, but one thing I'm endlessly curious about for him is at what point will he sort of take a step out of the established system? I'm really curious about that as a direction because the show has definitely flirted with the ideas that there are obvious flaws with superhero society, there are obviously people who fall between the cracks, and there are problems with this system and sort of a rigidity to it that perhaps leaves something to be desired. But even if there are no problems with it, I just think in any person's journey, especially a hero's journey, it doesn't really work if there's blind acceptance of an established system. For me, there's a key tonal difference between following the law because it's the law and following the law because you agree with the law, if that makes sense. Even if the result is exactly the same, there's a level of like conception and realization that's more interesting for a character to go down or that can be go down. And so while Dick was already very heroic and already a great person and very strong, when does he become like a leader? When does he become, I guess, this sort of fully realized person that isn't just on this career railroad path that's been laid in front of him? What does he choose to do with it? And is that a full choice? Strengths are obviously his force of will, his refusal to quit, his ability to take maximum responsibility without excuses, and his finger blasting technique, and his refusal to look away from what he feels is his responsibility, which I think ties into my point about sort of my hopes and expectations about him, where, where that leads him. You know, what happens when he meets villains, for example, like Shigaraki and sees their plum, to borrow a phrase from Fruits Basket. For All Might, I think it's sort of been borne out in the show, his weakness being that he took on a little bit too much, and that's a beautiful thing, and I, you know, it's hard for me to speak disparagingly of that, but I think that there are negative effects of that in terms of his own health which is his choice, but also the emotional toll it took on people who are concerned about him. And then also I think it fed into this idea that normal people can sort of defer their responsibility and defer their power to this one central figure, which contains a danger in it because if everyone's always looking up to this, you know, all-powerful figure or whatever, they're sort of going to be a little bit too quick to do so. And what happens when that power falls into the wrong hands? And I think that's maybe connected to why the society seems so fickle and while they're so back and forth between heroes and villains all the time. They're just waiting for like someone to descend and make the decisions for them. And I think All Might contributed to that in a small way. Bakugo's strength, also sheer power of will, focus, aptitude, weakness, and also strength in a way, being the chip on his shoulder. But there's definitely been development there. You know, I think that he's found an interesting way to balance this chip on his shoulder and also seeing that everyone's sort of part of the same game, that it's not a winner-take-all or zero-sum game. Deku, as a competitor, actually makes Bakugo stronger. But yeah, definitely social skills and media skills. DeAndre Zero asks, favorite quirk from 1B, not Mushroom Girl? I think Shadow's guy is pretty cool. I feel like that would be a really fun quirk to have and has a lot of potential to be really, really strong. But I think I'm going to go with Monoma just because of the unlimited potential of that. And I have a feeling he's going to become important later. I feel like that was very deliberately set up in those couple of scenes in season five where the audience needed to know that. They, they needed to know his power and sort of the limitations of it so that it can be applied later, that's my guess. Elise asks, what do you think about Bakugo's character development? Stunning, really, really surprising. One of the best surprises of the show. Bakugo is sort of remarkable in the fact that he can convey so much emotion without really doing anything. You know, there are moments of just like a still frame of Bakugo's face and you're like, oh man, he's really feeling it. You know, he's really going through some stuff right now. I don't know how they do that. It's pretty amazing. I think one of Bakugo's most enjoyable moments for me was realizing how similar he was to Deku and realizing that he's also on the same path and living up to this tremendous burden of responsibility, even if he has a very different idea of what that means. The Deku-Bakugo private nighttime fight was was great. Probably one of my favorite moments in the show, I'd say. As well as recently in season five where he totally took command. The guy shows up. He can be grating at times, but he also serves as this figure you can sort of count on. Um, you want him on your side, you know, because ultimately, superficialities aside, he's connected to a lot of the same things that the other characters are, and perhaps even more connected, and has greater aptitude to match. He also is surprisingly intuitive in certain moments, and keyed into what the other characters are going through. You know, he's always sort of watching and observing and listening in his subtle way. There's a depth there that's communicated that's been a joy to watch unfold. What do you predict happened to Toya? At this point, for lack of a better theory, I'm going with Dabi, just because the obvious fire thing and the fact that he seems to have suffered 
uh, debilitating accident and seems to have a grudge against Endeavor or at least some connection to Endeavor. I'm guessing that there was a training incident or he was just pushed too far too quickly and that led to a physical transformation as well as an emotional transformation and is probably the source of his trauma. But that could be all wrong. I mean, who knows? Muchi Mozzarella asks, what quirk would you want and what position or role do you think you'd realistically have in the My Hero universe? Quirk is so tough because there's so many good ones. I've gotten this question before and I've thought a lot about it and I just can't come away with one. If my options include things that have not been seen in the show so far, I'm going to go big and say immortality. But limited to this show, there have been a couple that I think would suit me well. One of those being Aizawa's quirk, just because I think that I sort of like the idea of being able to prevent things from happening rather than having to meet things through force. There's sort of a nice thing about being able to bring things to neutral. Also, although we haven't seen much of it, I imagine Nezu's quirk would suit me really well. And then in terms of fun, I feel like Mirio's quirk would be a blast. I mean, they really did a great job depicting that in the show, so I'm biased. And then what position or role do you think you'd have? I wouldn't make it through school. I don't think I could survive in My Hero Academia. I never really gelled that well with authority and lots of work, so maybe a vigilante, maybe even a villain. I feel like I would be one of those people that got pushed into a villain corner because I didn't like the constraints society put on me. Even if I had no ill will, you know, even if I didn't wish to do harm, I feel like there's a danger for me to end up in that camp and to react that way. Thinking more kindly and optimistically, maybe somebody who rises to something heroic, but in a different path. The conventional path's not my thing. Nick asks, do you think Deku's character is too bland or generic? I actually think his character is very distinct. I mean, Deku gives me a very, very distinct feeling. If I had to give any criticism that is maybe in the same sort of general category, I know I would get along with Deku. I'm not sure I would hang out with Deku. There's sort of a humorlessness to him, if that makes sense. He's very, very focused and is really kind and pure and a just solid guy, but doesn't have like that edge that I like from people and friends. Munchie Mozzarella asks, what is your actual favorite ship? I am and cheese. <laughs> or... Bakugo and Toroki's sister. <laughs> Gotta get that recipe, Bakugo. Do you plan to read the manga? This is one of those things where the interest is there, but it's not high priority just because of all the other things. I think it was really great reading that Vigilante's chapter before the Aizawa present mic episode. But generally speaking, I like having the information revealed to me through the course of the show. And I think if I were to read the manga, it would be sort of to supplement in hindsight. Like for example, I've heard that the show didn't really cover Spinner's arc. I might go back and read that, for example. But otherwise, I don't really have plans to read the full thing. Default Goblin asks, what character do you wish they did more with? With. So first thing that comes to mind, maybe unsurprisingly, Mirio was there in all his sun glory and then was gone. So I hope that he ends up getting his power back so he can be a more central point in the show just because I love him. And then I'm going to say something more controversial, which is All Might. And I can't really ask for this because I think this is sort of the point, right? But All Might is introduced as just this god among men and he is here and all that, but he's also not really here. Like we don't see that much of him. At the point we come into the story, he's sort of done and he has a couple glorious moments, but just in terms of what I think I would enjoy, I would love to have seen more of All Might being All Might, because we mostly get it from stories other people tell of him, and the legacy he's created that we see currently in others. Tim Lawrence asks, did you know Ida's voice actor is also Erwin from Attack on Titan? This would be more of a connection if I hadn't watched Attack on Titan dub, but if I'm not mistaken, he's also Scar in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, right? The guy has a lot of range. Shasha's Biz ADV asks, who gets to decide? Yeah, that's the question, right? And it's a tough one. Who does get to decide? I don't have a great answer for this, but I think I can say what is not the answer, even though this is something that commonly gets chosen, and I think the answer is not deferring personal responsibility for choices to others. I think the more we look up and the more we can consolidate power into one individual or a small group of individuals to make wide sweeping choices beyond what they can understand or what they bear the costs of, the more fragile society becomes and the more vulnerable the individual is. I think a stronger system is individual up, you know, where individuals decide as much as they can for themselves without hurting other people. And you hope that that creates this fence where each link in the chain is strong and is thinking and is aware. The more you put that off and the more you see it as like this top down thing where there's sort of a group of deciders that, you know, leak down their wisdom to others, you leave yourself vulnerable to the randomness of who ends up taking that spot, which is not always the people who are the wisest. It's often the people who are the loudest or the people who are the most manipulative even to think really cynically. There's a comfort and a temptation in giving up the role of choice and deferring responsibility outwards, but also a huge danger in there as well. Kingsley asks, which character do you feel you share the most similarities? Which character do you wish you were more like or admire? Which character do you share the most personal pitfalls and failings? <laughs> Similarities, I'm going to say Aizawa, especially because of the teaching connection. I feel like the way he talks to his class is so on point with what I like. Speaking of decisions, right, and turning a critical eye to the, you know, the, the system that you live in, there's a lot of baggage that jobs carry with them. And I think a lot of people, when they take on a role, they sometimes unthinkingly take on the baggage of the role because that's just the role in their minds. But lost in that equation is, what is our goal? You know, what is the purpose of this? And given that purpose, 
what is the best route to that purpose? And I think a lot of the time when you frame it that way, you realize that there are a lot of superficialities that have been built up and calcified over time that's sort of there as like this zombie protocol that is still alive despite having no life. But Aizawa cuts right through that. He knows from experience and, you know, from being really awake that this is life or death and I'm going to get you there because I care about you, right? That intention is really important because it's not about rank, right? It's about result. So strap yourselves in and the more you give, the more I will give. And I will leave you better than we started because if I if I don't, then I have failed. And that is sort of the guiding principle. It's not curriculum. It's not busy work. It's not making appearances. It's not being a figurehead, right? It's results based on regard and an understanding of the importance of what we're doing. Even outside of the school context, that is something that I value about myself where I feel I don't need to accept anything as it's delivered to me in order to have a robust worldview. I enjoy sort of blasting through the superficialities and getting to the core. You know, what's really at stake here? What's really important here? That kind of thing. Which character do you wish you were more like or admire? All of them? <laughs> Just extracting general things from the characters. Their ability to push themselves without complaint. To see the opportunity in their challenges and to take joy and inspiration inspiration from them. You know, I think it's way more common and way easier to have difficulty become this thing, this negative thing that just spirals out of control and inhibits action. When you see all the steps, you know, you see how far you have to go, you see all your failings, and that's a point of defeat. But for the characters, it's a point of burning passion. You know, it's like, I must overcome this. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to rise to the challenge. And it ends up being fuel for them to be amazing. It does feel to me like this process of not having waste, right? It's like even the negative, you know, even the challenges are productive. And that's something I really like. And at the same time, it's unselfish, right? Like it doesn't try to take other people down to make themselves feel better. In fact, most of the characters can see, and I think correctly so, that other people's successes make them themselves better and only contribute to the whole, which is why they're able to be so supportive. They just have this lens where all their inputs end up being utilized productively and, and beautifully. And I think even though we don't really hear this that much, I think that's a choice. You know, I think it's a choice that people can make. I think people will write it off as optimism, you know, maybe blind or foolish optimism where, yeah, it's cliche, you know, they rise to the challenge or whatever. But no, I think that actually that is a thing that can be grabbed. It's just very difficult. And that's where that comes in and pitfalls and failings <laughs> yes <laughs> where to begin shigaraki <laughs> no maybe manana <laughs> this is perhaps going to sound arrogant just to have my name in the same sentence as this other character but i think it's okay because it's a flaw and that's all my you know i actually really resonated with the idea that you can maybe do too much. It's easy to sort of take things on your own shoulders when people wouldn't ask you to do that if they knew what you were doing. You know what I mean? I think it's easy to fall into the trap where you need to justify your existence and to think that you are not sufficiently valuable. And so you compensate by pushing yourself to the point where you're sort of tearing yourself apart in certain key ways. The sad irony of that being that actually you've already earned your value to people who care about you and you're actually making things worse by harming yourself. Like nobody would wish that for you people who actually care about you at least. I often have that fear in my heart that I'm never doing enough and I will sacrifice if I don't catch myself to the point where it ends up being counterproductive because it even brings down the things I'm trying to do. Valley asks, this show highlights the bonds and teamwork of the class. How important do you find friendships, collaboration, and camaraderie? I actually was reflecting on this a lot this past year just because I was mostly isolated and I told myself that I could do that and the answer turned out to be that I, I couldn't. I mean, I didn't even know how much it was affecting me until I met my girlfriend and went insane and dropped everything to move to Korea before I had a visa and all the difficulties that that brought. I mean, I just got my visa and I'm living a stable life six months later and I was sort of hellish in a way. I think in general, it's going to be a mistake to deny or believe we can rise above or go beyond our most basic human needs, even if it's tempting to believe that, you know, even if it's tempting to believe that life is just how you rationalize it and you can, you know, rationalize yourself out of certain needs. It catches up to you. It forms these tiny cracks that end up destabilizing the whole. I really think that while there might be some exceptions, just about everyone in the world needs some form of friendship or something like that. It's just going to differ in what form that takes and to what degree that's needed from person to person. Speaking just for myself, I can say that the times where I felt the most alive and most connected to my own life were all times where my social satisfaction was at its peak. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Jess asks death predictions. Someone in class 1A, I feel, it's not going to be Invisible Girl because she'll slip by unnoticed. And it's not going to be Mineta because he's going to have a glorious redemption arc for all his misdeeds. I just get the feeling it will be someone from 1A and also a top hero. Maybe Hawks or maybe in 
Dever? Just wild guesses here. Man's local bakery asks, how do you think Bakugo will compare to Izuku once they're adults? Do you think Bakugo will be strong enough? I have this theory that this greatest hero of all time thing that Deku keeps talking about is correct, but in a different form than we've seen it so far. It's not the All Might model, it's a collaboration. And in that sense, my feeling is that Bakugo will be a major leading part of that and will be an essential link in this network they develop where they're more powerful as a whole than any one person ever could have been and where they bear each other's burdens to the point where it's not a draining thing like it was for All Might. But yeah, he'll be a big part of that, and he's definitely going to be strong enough, and he's definitely going to be a hero of epic proportions, no question. Athena asks, what are your thoughts about the progression and development of Shigaraki and Ko? I think that Season 5, the end of Season 5, really, really made it a whole new thing. <laughs> like, it was clear they were building, it was clear they were growing, and they had an arc, but the last couple episodes really felt like in a way, it told the first full story of them, if that makes sense. They're an interesting lot. You know, they don't all fall into the same category in my mind. There are people like Twice, let's say, who are sort of there without any, you know, deep-seated hatred of the world or malicious intent and is more just about them needing people and needing community and kind of falling on the wrong side of things through circumstance and their inability to navigate out of that circumstance. Although I really do appreciate, as I spoke about, the fact that twice his progression wasn't seen as him being a total victim, right? Like he slid into it. It was both the circumstances of his life and also the fact that he made small, tiny concessions over time that sort of led him down this road. But then you also have more malicious intent, like for example, Dabi seems to fall in that camp, as well as Shigaraki, who just wants to see the world destroyed and everything being, you know, burned, burned to hell or disintegrated to hell. Although you also have that redeeming thing with him where it's not that he doesn't value anything, even though he says he doesn't. He obviously values his crew. So there's something there for all of them. And what I love about it is how much of a great contrast it builds between that school and the actual school, where you have just two extremes that are going to meet and intersect, and it's going to be powerful to watch that happen. As for their motives, I think as is the case with, you know, any good villain, there's an element of truth to what they're saying. They represent the other side of this shiny facade that, you know, hero society is great and there's always going to be someone to save you and we can stamp out evil and live peacefully. That's not realistic and there's also a peril to sort of having this utopian fantasy. Though obviously I take huge issue with Shigaraki's conclusion that because there is pain, you know, even really horrible pain or really atrocious things in the world, that the solution to that is to bring it all to dust that just falls into the old problem of like you know being the very thing that you hate but that's the question that the heroes have to solve and it won't be satisfying unless it's given its due and light is shed on that based on your current skills abilities talents what would your actual quirk be so not my desire but my actual quirk i think it would be something in a certain category we've seen in the show that's like psychological or emotional or people based rather than being physical based examples of this would be aizawa labrava shinzo i think something that is interactional with other people and isn't necessarily about force but about something more intangible. I think that would suit my personality. I can actually imagine a good fit for me would be a spin-off of Aizawa perhaps where it's not that I can negate other people's quirks, but that other people's quirks perhaps don't work on me. Because I think one of the things I pride in myself is my autonomy of thought, where I'm going to fight bitterly to make sure that as much as possible, everything in myself is of my own choosing and where I'm not blindly accepting what's been handed to me, especially if those things that have been handed to me do not directly benefit me, but benefit other interests that are perhaps not aligned with my own, if that makes sense. I mean, even if I accept the things that are commonly accepted, it's done autonomously. It's done of choosing rather than of not having thought of other options or a willingness to defer the choice, if that makes sense. Sage asks, what was your favorite My Hero Academia moment and why is it beach training? It was beach training because of the mentor pupil thing, because I just love training in general, and because who doesn't love the beach, right? But aside from beach training, I'll mention a couple that come to mind. One is Ari at the concert. Surprising moment, but got me. Like few other moments have. All Might's last stand against All for One. Mirio's quirkless battle. Endeavor's fist in the air. That was amazing. Deku's can I even call myself a hero? And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, not that I liked it, but in terms of its impact, was... Shigaraki's backstory with his parents and family and dog. JD the Bud asks, what is your favorite season and or arc of the show so far? I feel like this might be controversial, but I feel like my favorite season as a whole was actually season one. While I've enjoyed all the seasons of the show and they each were special in their own unique way, there's something about the magic of season one, and I think a big part of it is All Might, Deku, and their mentor-pupil relationship and discovering the world and entering the school and all the excitement that that built. But I think part of that is not the show itself, but also just me and my experience, my excitement. So that aside, I think I would probably give it to season four, just because I think it was one of the most remarkable seasons in terms of everything that happened and sort of the, the highs and lows and the range that were in there. You get the overhaul arc, which was spectacular in terms of the, you know, the final fight with Deku, but also, of course, with the introduction of Mirio and his crew and what at that point had been one of the most refined parts of the journey for Shigaraki and crew, battling overhaul in this interesting sort of three-way thing. But then you get this slice of life of all 
small slice of life's arc with the the concert, which really earned itself and had one of the, the greatest payoffs of the whole show, as well as a look into All Might's past. The fact that I was introduced to Night Eye, who I initially wasn't that fond of, but then, you know, by the end was devastated by the loss of. And then just so many other things in there as well, like the whole gentle arc, which I know is not people's favorites, but I, I happen to really love, especially because it was like a social media villain. It's a tough choice because all of the seasons have moments that just cannot be ignored and are stand out. Like, I think it was season three that had the Bakugo Deku fight. Am I remembering that correctly? And perhaps that was also the season of All Might All for One. Season 2 had the tournament arc, which is incredible. So it's all very close. I would just give it to Season 4 for its range and sort of the fact that it really, really hit a lot of highs consistently for me. DVK asks, what did you dislike about the show? I can't really articulate this very well, but I felt in certain episodes that a lot happened really quickly, and there, there are these moments that are supposed to be really, really huge and triumphant, but it all feels a little bit too neat, and it almost feels like the writer, or maybe even just the anime storyboarder or whatever, because of limited time, throws sort of a, a lob ball to the heroes that they can just smash out of the park really easily. An example of this would be an episode that seemed to be really impactful for a lot of people that sort of fell flat for me, which was the Coda rescue arc. The villain sort of came out of nowhere, I think, and wasn't really given enough time to be significant and was just sort of bad. You know, it was just really bad. And that gave Deku a backboard against which he could go plus 1000 or whatever it was. And there definitely were really cool parts about that, like, you know, Deku actually being in action and actually saving someone. But the surrounding circumstances of that, I felt I wasn't able to fully connect with to the point where it was as meaningful as it could have been. And I've even felt that about episodes where I really did get a lot out of it, where I feel like I could have gotten more out of it if they were maybe done at a different pace. For example, the Endeavor episode to end season four. Speaking of season four having everything, the Noma was very neatly a parallel for Endeavor. It, it, that makes sense, if you know what I mean. It's not even a negative thing to the point where it makes me not enjoy it. It's just something that I'm aware of while watching sometimes, where it's like, well, this is happening very quickly and it's going to be wrapped up very neatly. I'll give a contrast to this from the show, just to prove that the show can do it and very often does it. And that would be the Deku Bakugo fight, where that is such a, a build, right? You don't even realize it's building until it's there. But it's all been there from the beginning. The groundwork has been laid so that when it does come out, when Bakugo does have that big reveal, it hits you like a Detroit smash. You know, it's so momentous because you're like, this is who he's been this whole time, if that makes sense. Similarly, I think the Shigaraki build sort of culminating so far with the end of season five is another great example of that. So the show can do that. At other times, it feels like the whole thing is sort of encapsulated in one or two episodes. CE Fitness asks, what are your top three favorite fights of the series so far? Deku Overhaul, number one. Deku Bakugo, number two. All Might, All for One, number three. Runner up, the whole, the whole whole thing of Heroes Rising. I've already mentioned shipping, but favorite platonic relationship. Let's go with All Might Aizawa. They have a really, really interesting dynamic. They're sort of perfect. And of course, also Deku Bakugo. Justin Anus. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> wow. Which story arc did you enjoy the most? This is a lot harder than season. This isn't necessarily my favorite. It's just up there. And I want to say it because this is an opportunity to remove it from the full season. That would be the stain arc, especially the culmination with Deku, Todoroki, Ida. I was really moved by that. Razi asks, thoughts on Endeavor's character arc so far? Really impressed by the, the boldness to try to take that character and do something like Redemption, you know, to give him a, can I call it a second chance? To not totally give up on the character and have him be just this terrible, evil person. The end, right? It's complex. And I'm always going to value things that have any sufficient degree of complexity just because life is complex. And as much as we'd like to write people off, and as much as we'd like to see things in categories of good, bad, you know, and punish the wicked, etc. I think there is a richer viewpoint to be had, which is that you don't necessarily need to forgive and you don't need to believe that a person's actions are okay, but that there's something greater to be gained by allowing that person, assuming that they've learned something and have changed to continue moving forward and to maybe even use those experiences to do good things. There's this desire I see coming up a lot in shows but also in life that's something like bad people must be punished, right? Evil must die, that kind of thing. And I think there are solid reasons for that, but also impure reasons that come up a lot. You know, the solid reasons being you don't want to see evil perpetuated without pushback. You want things that harm others to be brought to an end. You also, you know, accepting the fact that some people just are out to do bad needs some kind of structure that prevents that or risk to people who would engage in those behaviors. So there's the deterrent element of it. But then there's something else, which I think is just a desire for vengeance and a desire to have the world match one's own desires of what the world should be. And this might be taking it to somewhat of a dark place, but I think some of that, at least, stems from people's feelings of not being free. If people are good, not because they want to be good, but because of an expectation of reward, then there's a dissonance that arises from seeing other people do bad things and go on to lead good lives or go on to even be heroic figures. That's a threat to one's worldview if 
a person doesn't get actual utility out of being good, but gets utility out of maybe wanting praise or keeping their nature in check because of those external pressures that I mentioned. I think you can ask the question, if you know that the person has reformed or if there's ample evidence the person has reformed and if they have potential to do good in society or in their small communities or whatever, what is to be gained by that kind of severe punishment? Wouldn't reform always be desirable in terms of the potential that creates? Assuming the person really has changed, the answer will probably be something that's deeply emotional. There's also this question of to what extent do your crimes become intrinsic to your being, right? Like do your worst actions define you? And if they do, how long do they define you? Is it sort of a game over for your your soul. And I think, I don't have a concrete answer for that, but I know what I'd like to think and what I think is perhaps a practical way to think, which is that, well, you got to be careful not to condone the behavior and you got to be careful that the behavior doesn't continue. I would like to believe that you can do good despite your mistakes and that you can reinvent yourself and that experience and penance does count for something because without that, I'm doomed. <laughs> it's a selfish thing for me as well. And so Endeavor's arc is a really great chance to reflect on all these things. And like I said, a bold choice because it would be way easier for him to just have been cartoonishly evil villain, the end, and we all hate him, right? For me, it's more interesting that he's simultaneously this atrocious figure, at least in the past, but has true greatness in his way and is able through the force of will that is so common to the characters, start to do better things, start to try to make things right, even if he can't undo all the terrible things he's caused. But that's not all there is to Endeavor either, right? There's also the fact that he <laughs> has this great element of being an all might shadow and then doing this thing I love where they sort of redefine that journey and they become more authentic and in the process achieve the dream they never could achieve while they were being inauthentic, if that makes sense. I love All Might's conversation with Endeavor, which we saw like three or four times in flashbacks where he asks him, what does it mean to you? Like, why does it mean so much to you? And for the first time, Endeavor starts to consider it and realize all the ways he's gone wrong. And it's sort of that freeing process that he undergoes that allows him to become something like that. It's just different from what he imagined it to be. And it's better than he imagined it to be. I think that's a great metaphor and parable just for life where, you know, you think success is this and you measure yourself against that success, but there might be a greater success to be had if you could just peel back some of the layers, you know, some of the rigidity in which we approach ourselves and our lives and the way we imagine ourselves to be, you know, and look at what we, we actually are. Cass Senpai asks, if you could have changed any event in the story so far, what would you change? Not sure I would change anything. The only thing that comes to mind that I was sort of unsatisfied with is recently, I think it was the first battle, maybe the second battle of the class 1A versus class 1B. There was something about that fight and mushroom girl that left a sour taste in my mouth. If I could go back and change it, Class 1A would have swept like I predicted, just so I could be right. Eric Gilreath asks, character you want to see more of, character you want to see less of. Character I want to see more of, definitely Mirio, as I mentioned. Character I want to see less of, I don't know, I feel like it's pretty well balanced. I I guess this is going to be controversial. Baby's girl, I mean, we don't really see her that much, but she kind of freaks me out. Sarah asks, if you had to be housemates, one hero, including the students, and one villain, who would they be and why? I'm reading this as like a who would you get along with question. For hero, I'm going to go with Kirishima, just because he has a badass room that I would spend all my time in. And also he brings that positive energy, which is what I like. You know, I think that's the kind of person I want to be around for long periods of time. Someone who just makes things fun and makes things pleasant. You know, I like that. As for the villain, assuming we're on the same side and assuming I don't have to, you know, put up with evil deeds. I feel like Toga would be interesting. Toga seems like she'd be fun to hang out with. That would be sitcom level living. Me and Kirishima and Toga. The danger of that pairing though is I feel like it might be disorganized household chores might not be properly delegated, and I'm including myself in that. Taylor Goff asks, do you have any conspiracy theories? I suspected Nezu as the spy, though I'm increasingly less convinced of that as the show goes on. Another one I have, and this is also sort of dampened recently by Shigaraki's backstory, is that I sort of feel that All for One was guiding the events of Shigaraki's life a little bit more than we've seen so far. It just seems a little bit convenient that he's like right there at Shigaraki's worst moment, especially since Shigaraki has the Nana connection. How accurately is Shigaraki remembering it? And if he is remembering it clearly, what is omitted? You know, what's happening behind the scenes? I wouldn't be surprised if there's some manipulation there. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's key in sort of changing course for Shigaraki, maybe. Joe Martin asks, do you think Shigaraki can redeem himself or is he just too far gone? And I saw this question on YouTube as well. So going back to the Endeavor question, I think in some way, at least, yes. I think he's sort of too far gone to have everything be okay. It's never going to be okay again. The Corgi is never coming back and that sort of seals it for me and you know, also his family. But it doesn't mean he has to be a villain forever. It doesn't mean that he can't change direction. And I actually suspect that's where it's going just because of who Deku is, right? Like there's been all of this setup about Deku being a meddler and Deku not being able to give up on people. And if I can't do this, can I even be a hero? And saving people, saving people who need to be saved. Who needs to be saved more than Shigaraki? In a certain sense, if you know what I mean. And I think what makes that an interesting and compelling thought for me is that Deku will likely have to grapple with some of the flaws of society and actual evil in the world that I don't think he's really conceptualized fully yet. 
in order to reach Shigaraki, in order to get there. He's gonna have to go to like a Toru place of understanding first and see Shigaraki's plum in order to reach him. And so it's interesting for both of them and their contrast is sort of perfect in its way. And this is being hinted at, right? I mean, they're on these parallel paths. They, they both have their father figures. They have their very strong and opposite ideals. And so it's inevitable that they're gonna crash into each other and it's gonna be a whirlwind and something will emerge. And I don't think knowing Deku, it's gonna be as simple as like Shigaraki being defeated, especially given what I just said about Endeavor, right? Where this show has proven it can do the difficult work. It can not give up on even the worst people. Alberto Sanchez asks, you worried about losing any characters? Yeah, I have a very strong feeling that people are gonna die in season six, like I said. I think that some characters' deaths would hit harder than others. Those would be All Might, Aizawa. Obviously, Deku and Bakugo, though, I don't think that is possible. Ida would hit me really hard. I don't want Mineta to die, not because I'm in love with him, but because I really am sort of hoping that he'll have this amazing redemption thing or this character growth that other characters have experienced. So that would be premature. Joe Martin asks, do you think any of the heroes are going to die? Yeah, I have a very strong feeling heroes are going to die as well. And I think that Aizawa is a possibility. I think that Endeavor is a possibility because even though he's already gone down the sort of redemption pathway, it's a big thing in shows that death is a redeemer, right? And so that's always sort of lurking there as an option. Hawks, I think also is a huge possibility because he's playing a very dangerous game. And then there are a lot of other heroes to choose from. Right? There's a very long list. I think we've seen as low as like 590 something, but not best genus. And it asks top three favorite quirks. I'm going to say Muriel, Aizawa, and just for fun, you know, a really, really fun one is Amajiki. Nathan asks, if you lived in the My Hero Academia universe, would you want to be a hero? Actually, I think no, not in the legal sense. No, I don't think I would make a good career hero unless I could be a career hero like Aizawa, who, you know, he does his thing and he knows who he is and what he wants, but he's not sort of trapped in the career of it. I think there's there's something about the My Hero Academia structure that to me seems stifling. I mean, even though I get it, and I think it's really amazing what they managed to do, given all the risks of this kind of society where everyone has a quirk that you don't even know when they're a kid, and you know, etc. It doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't appeal to me to have to go through this very intensive educational system and get your license and do this bureaucratic thing and that bureaucratic thing and constantly be mindful of overstepping this or that. I think I would probably fall in line with the Redestro Society if they weren't so over the top and terrible. Amelia Maria asks, I've seen people say that Bakugo or Todoroki would be a better protagonist. Why do you think that is and to what extent do you agree? Honestly, while I like Bakugo as a character, I think he works so well partly because of Deku you know, as sort of this parallel but different version of Deku, if that makes sense. I also think that in order for My Hero Academia to be My Hero Academia, you need the heart, you know, there's the action part of it and the strength part of it, but a really key element of it is the emotional side of it the goodness of it, the inspiration of it. And Bakugo has that in his way, but I think Deku is a much better avatar for that. He's in a more typical range of emotion, I'd say, and has a sweetness that I think is actually really important, even though it's easy to mock, it's easy to call him overly sensitive, perhaps. I actually think that's part of what makes the show so great. Todoroki is also cool, but again, I feel like he, he works really well as that sort of part of the trio as his own thing. I honestly, I don't think I'd make any changes. And also for that matter, they already do such a great job covering these characters that it sort of doesn't matter that much how you move around the priorities. Because really what makes it special is not any one character, but their ensemble. The Fault Goblin asks, what quirk from the show do you think would be the most useful one to have in normal life? Teleporting. Teleporting would be really useful. Flying. Flying quirks as well. Amelia Maria also asks whether or not All Might was a good mentor to Deku since he gave him this power he can't control and perhaps didn't offer the same level of guidance that he himself received. Then I would say, if I recall correctly, it was Deku's choice. And I think that there is an unknown element to that that Deku couldn't have anticipated, but that's just true of life's choices in general. And I think as long as Deku makes that choice, it's Deku's choice to make if it's being offered. Just putting myself in Deku's shoes, it would drive me nuts if I was 14 and I met All Might and All Might offered me this power and other people told me I couldn't. For me, it would be like, who are you to make this decision for me? I mean, is it because of my age? I, like, I remember being 14 and being very, very concretely aware of the fact that age was not a guarantee of wisdom. Perhaps there's a correlation, but we're not dealing with an average here. We're dealing with a, an individual. And it turned out to be the right choice. So that was borne out quite nicely, I think. And also, when you think about it, Deku has his power and, you know, that gives him a certain obligation, but he rose to that obligation as a choice. He also could have just not done it. Like, he could have gotten to the point where it was overwhelming and said, you know what, All Might, you made a mistake. And that would have been really unsatisfying. But again, you can't discount the choice. He's continuing to make the choice to do these things. And he's also refining them and, you know, being more conscientious of his own body and his mother and things like that. So I think All Might took a risk. That's true. I think All Might put a lot of faith in Deku, but I don't think that's 
wrong and I don't think that that makes him a bad mentor. I think he's a great mentor in many ways. The only thing I would say that is sort of odd about his mentorship, which is not even necessarily a bad thing, it's just different, is that, like I said, he feels more like a peer at times to me, to Deku, than this, you know, mentor pupil thing. But that works because Deku is so self-directed that that's not the gap that needs to be filled. You know, All Might doesn't need to push Deku necessarily. Deku pushes Deku harder than anyone could push Deku. So All Might needs to pick up the slack, which interestingly is the same thing that All Might needed himself, which is like concern and care. Could he have prepared Deku for it more? Perhaps. But I really like the relationship and I think All Might did a great thing for Deku and shows really well. And also that ultimately at the end of the day, it's Deku's choice to make. Blood Mist asks, who is the traitor? It's Nezu. And if it's not Nezu, it's us in our own hearts. Samuel D. Bomb asks, if you were into eugenics, what two quirks would make an S-class hero? Aizawa and a gun. <laughs> gun guy, whatever his quirk is. Disarm and kill. Matt asks, what is something you really want to happen in the next season? Deku Shigaraki meeting, but not just fighting. I want to see ideological conflict. I also, like I said, I want Deku to not just be realized as a hero, but be realized as a person, like an adult in the world, you know? Although one year is like nine seasons, so that might take a while. Are there any villains you think are redeemable? It depends on what you mean by redemption, but I would say at least to a certain extent, all of them. Who is your favorite character based on design alone, Mirio? That body though. Which character would you hate the most if they were a real person? Visible girl. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Invisible girl. I like Bakugo a lot, but I don't think he and I would get along. Hate is a strong word, but I feel like I wouldn't spend a lot of time with Bakugo. I don't think that would be fun. I don't think I'd enjoy it. Unless it was in a professional context. Like there was a goal, like a tournament or something. Or a class assignment that involved fighting. Just in terms of hanging out, we wouldn't gel that well. And that's not really surprising because Bakugo just doesn't gel, period. I also, and this is ignoring the backstory that I didn't get from the show. Spinner is a little bit of a zealot for me. I'm not really a huge fan of zealotry. Oh, I made a huge mistake in that roommate question. Aoyama would be a great choice too. Think of all the cheese you could have. Mursan asks, Eri versus Koda, Deku's biggest fan. Gotta be Eri because of that concert. Koda was not at that concert. Why didn't he get invited. Tyler Sitter asks, are there any inspirations from the show you have applied to yourself, your daily life? Absolutely. I think about the show all the time since the beginning. I mean, for one thing, I started working out. If I remember correctly, because of the show, it was definitely at the same time. It's hard to explain, but there's just life right? And there are things I have to do, and there are challenges, and there are difficulties. But this show has allowed me to conceptualize. There's a choice in how I frame it. There's a way of framing it that's tiring, that sees things as a burden, that is a draining force, and is a chore and a task, and fills me with dread. But there's another way of framing those very same things that gives me joy and connection to my life. And I think part of that comes from imagining ideals, like Deku has with All Might, and like a lot of characters have with All Might and other heroes in the show, where, ah, this is something that feels good to envision. This is the person that I want to be. Not in some sort of, you know, just weirdly abstract stated way. It's like thinking about this gets me pumped up. To be All Might, you know, to be this kind of person that shows up and does what he has to do and is good doing it and never gives up and sees the utility and beauty in his actions and knows exactly who he is and what he stands for and will not deviate from that. That is such a thrill that I can then look at those things like, again with a new eye and say, this is my moment. You know, this is a moment to take on these things and win. You know, and even if I fail, it's still a victory because I took them on. You know, that's one of the other things about the characters that I really love is that even in their failings, they're winning. You know, even in their failings, they're growing because they're not being defeated by them and they're not using them as sort of ways to label themselves for the negative. Like, oh, I'm just so terrible or like, I'll never make it. I mean, even if they have moments like that occasionally, ultimately that feeds back into, well, I got to just work harder or work smarter or whatever it is because I already have tasted the glory of imagining myself as this figure and nothing else could compare to that and so nothing's going to get in my way that energy is real and is something i can now draw on i mentioned this before but there's that line deku has blah 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 blah. can i even call myself a hero that's such a good way of conceptualizing it although you can replace hero with, with something more general like you know who i want to be or whatever you only have so much time in life yet every day is an opportunity you know every day is an opportunity to show up or not show up and i know from experience having gone down both roads that showing up is where it's at and the more i can clear out obstacles to that like self-doubt and fear and being too short-term oriented, not recognizing it as a larger process, being bitter of other success. You know, the more I can clear all that stuff out of the way and the more connected I am to that vision and the more I allow that to feed back into my self-identity and my sense of responsibility and my choices, then the stronger I become and the more equipped I am to handle anything. Quaid Hudson asks, Selkie or Hound Dog? Selkie's cute, but I'll take inspiration over cuteness any day. So I'm going with Hound Dog. Comical Skate asks, what is a hero to you? One of the things I love about the show so much is that hero means multiple things, but ultimately at its purest 
form, it's something that doesn't require powers. Or at least the powers have a real life counterpart, which is action, let's say. It's hard to define it outright, but certain key elements of it are ultimate responsibility for oneself, making oneself strong enough that they are not only self-sustaining, but a pillar that supports others or that ripples out into the lives of others. And we'll do this not because of obligation, but because of real understanding, you know, real awareness and, and awakeness to what that really means and to how it's connected to more than just abstract principles of right and wrong, but to genuine connection to others and to the world. And then from there, we'll not deviate towards those things when it's easy and we'll be willing to sacrifice circumstantially for the preservation of those ideals. I think one possible way to conceptualize heroism is to think of it as an answer to the question of how should we live? What is the optimal way of living so that if everyone were to live that way, we would sort of be in this optimal place, let's call it. And it's sort of fascinating to me how even though we can't really articulate perfectly these layers of right and wrong, we recognize them when we see them. And I think it's built into us. You know, I think there's a history that we carry not only societally and mentally, but also biologically. Like we exist in the world and there's been millennia and millennia of existence. And that's a lot of paths that have been explored. And we're here because we're doing certain things right. And those things are very much intrinsically a part of us, even if we can't fully identify them. And so I think a hero represents those threads of the best things that have enabled us to exist and will allow us to continue to exist and exist better in the future. Future. Not just now, but perpetually. And that's where I think the conflict lies, as well as the scarcity, as well as the sacrifice. Because there's sort of this double game being played at once that often seems contradictory, where there are things that we could do in our immediate moment that would improve our lives, or that would feel good, or that would help us get what we want. But a lot of times that success or that game is only won very briefly. And then there are ripple effects of that that create a greater net loss than the individual gain. And those things are often counterintuitive. But a hero is someone who's able to see past that and do things that go beyond the person's immediate need in a way that creates sustainable, joyous even life and avoids some of the biggest tragedies of like believing in just the utility of immediate reward and immediate circumstance and the disposability of others towards that aim or whatever it may be. And instead being that pillar of strength, being strong enough to make other choices, even if it means one's own peril. Openings is tough. For the nostalgia vote, I can't answer this question without mentioning the first opening, the very first one. For me, that encapsulates that time, you know, the beginning of My Hero Academia, where I just was just so pumped up to be on this journey, starting this journey, and was quickly realizing how much the show had to offer. But again, aside from the nostalgia vote, it would be a tie, I think, between this most recent opening in season five, everything will be all right, and ba 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 da ba da <laughs> I still do that. Like, I still... When I sense that the show is about to start, the episode's about to start, I'm still in the habit of doing ba da 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 da, -da. <laughs> I just went back and watched it to confirm. And yeah, the, the breakdown at the end is incredible, as well as Deku sort of rising to stand up alongside All Might. I just love it. And then endings, it's easy. By far, best ending is doo doo doo. Best song is doo doo doo, period. Samuel D. Bomb asks, What is your take on fan service? What about fan service when it is of high schoolers? You had to ask this, didn't you? <laughs> Personally, I've never gotten the appeal of fan service, and I get absolutely nothing out of it. You know, I feel the same way watching cooking shows because I'm not interested in cooking, I'm interested in eating, and I can't eat the food in the show, so what the hell is the point? About the high schooler thing, honestly, it doesn't bother me. I know this is controversial, but I think it's unnecessary. I'll say that. So it's not a positive for me, but I think that criticisms of it, they often draw on the idea that it supports it, but I think that generally people are smart enough to distinguish media from real life. You know, it's like we've all played GTA. It's fun to play GTA, but it doesn't make me want to plow my car into pedestrians. You know what I mean? And then also what just makes it absolutely clear cut for me is that it's animated and that the anime characters are one, not accurate representations of people in terms of their physiology, but also that they're not real. So there's no danger. I really do think that the argument against it relies on the idea that this is seen as an encouragement of it. But I don't really think that's where people's minds are. I just think it's more like people who want fan service they're appealed by sexuality, but since the depictions of it are not really linked to age necessarily, but are just sort of in anime land where ages make absolutely no sense, that it's just that element that they enjoy and not necessarily the high school element of it that they enjoy. They're not seeing the age, right? They're seeing physical descriptors. And if those physical descriptors match adulthood and are attractive features, then that's just going to hit you a certain way. It's just how we're wired. People want it to be the simple thing of like, you're evil because you saw fan service in an animated show of someone who is in the story in high school. It, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. CRS asks, UA builds out a mental health department with a peer counseling program. Students are paired according to who Hound Dog, good choice, things can help each other best. Who would you pair? 
Mirio and Mineta, I feel, would be cool. Why did that come to mind? I feel like Mineta could use a big bro figure. Bakugo and Tokoyami might be good for each other, just because, for all his talk about darkness, Tokoyami could use some edge, perhaps, and Bakugo could use some softness and some politeness. Sue and Mineta also would be good. Why am I thinking about Mineta so much? I think I want to be a big bro to Mineta. I think that's the takeaway. Oh, also Bakugo. I'm ashamed I'm forgetting his name right now. The kid who can talk to animals. He could use that edge, and Bakugo could use that that sweetness. For reasons established in the show, Amajiki and Mirio, they're a really great pair. I'm trying to find someone for Ida. I need someone who would help him let loose a little bit and unwind and who he would give structure, but I'm struggling to think of who that would be because they're all sufficiently structured. Maybe Kaminari? Silent Shadow asks, what do you think about the idea of Deku being a villain? I think that it's really intriguing and I think there actually is a really good case to be made for him being a villain in the legal sense because as I've alluded to a couple times today, he is this great and powerful person and really, really wants the best for people. But what will happen when that comes into conflict with the law? I think he sides with his heart. I don't think he sides with the law. I don't think he falls in line. And so he's sort of at the mercy of whichever way the legal structure goes, the society goes. And it's not hard to imagine him falling outside of that and setting up something he believes in that is not condoned, if that makes sense. But I think very crucially, it would be a villain only in that sense, right? It would be a villain only in the sense that he's given that label because he's gone rogue in that way. But it would not be in terms of his heart or in terms of him wanting to harm others. I don't see that happening. David Sadegiza Day asks, What do you think is the reason the show is so adored by so many? I think part of it is the fact that it manages to do a hero show with powers in a way that makes the heroes and powers not important. It makes for great action and it makes for really cool visual representations of character growth. But really, it's the growth that's the thing. And it gives you this huge web of experiences and feelings, all of which feel real and feel relatable. You know, like the evil is real. The flaws in society are real. But so are the characters reflections you know so are their virtues and you get this great and powerful and triumphant action stuff that is sort of balanced out and enhanced by these slice of life really sweet moments so it really just has it all and it just cuts right to the bone and also just generally it's well written music is amazing some of the animation is really stunning it can be really funny it's not padded it just does a lot of things really well and touches on some things that, that really cut deep martin van buren the third asks i commented talking about how i've had these moments where i find myself in an existential state of realizing i'll never create anything of equal magnitude or impact in my life. How do you process these feelings? Does everyone have a desire to create, be a part of, and leave a lasting impact to the same degree? As I think I responded to this, I understand exactly this feeling you're talking about. You know, when you finish a great work, you're like, man, I'll never do anything like that. But I think perhaps the best way to look at that is that now you've been lucky enough to have a challenge laid down at your feet. You've been awakened to something beautiful, something higher. And interestingly, that thing largely exists in the show as the vehicle that brought it out of you. But actually a lot of it exists in yourself because you're the one having those feelings, right? So the question is then what do you do with that? How do you take that and do something with it? And I think that the fact that you feel you haven't done that only means you haven't done that yet. And isn't that in some way a ticket to your destiny? And also I think that the wider out you allow that to be, rather than having a specific vision that it's like, I need to create a show like this or something like that, right? It's like, I need to build something or make something or be someone even that rises to the challenge of this ideal. And that is possible. That is 100% possible and probably does not matter what the circumstances are for you. Separating out of that the idea of wanting to be validated, I think that there's just something in there of wanting to live up to your own expectations. And that's a great thing. I think there are many, many ways to leave a legacy and they're not limited to grand actions or master works. I think that they can be experienced even on a daily basis, just at a, a small individual level, if that makes sense. I know it sounds weird. Just by definition of your existence, you can't not leave an impact. And it's just a question of what kind of impact will you leave? And perhaps even more importantly, how do you feel about what you've done and how you acted? I feel this way quite often about movies and shows, but I also get this experience sometimes maybe at a smaller scale from music. And then I start imagining myself like making music and making music so amazing that it blows everyone away. But the truth is I'm not really interested in music. There's something else there. Like I'm interested in that feeling of glory. I'm interested in preserving the emotion that it gave me and the connectedness to something higher that I experienced. But that's sort of there for the taking. You know, that's there for the taking in multiple arenas. That's there through thought even. It's just lucky, I think, to have had that experience at all because it's sort of like a pathway being opened. You know, there's an awareness that there's something like that out there. It's a hell of a lot better than, you know, being numb you know, and not having any spark whatsoever and, you know, not feeling. I would say it's a gift, you know, and like the characters in this show, the more you can sort of put it behind you and use it as a source of fuel, the closer and closer you get to that. And the more dedication you give it and the more time you allow it, the more guaranteed it becomes. Karen asks, could you make a character tier list? I'll give top 10 favorite characters. Let's do that. In not necessarily in order, but just as they come to mind. Mirio, All Might, Deku, Aizawa, Ida, Shigaraki, Kirishima, Bakugo, Mineta, and Hound Dog. <laughs> nah, he hasn't had enough screen time. Uraraka, tied with Sue. Ranga Rage asks, which hero villain do you think has had the best character development? Hero, I'd say 
Deku and Bakugo. Villain, definitely Shigaraki. Tobe asks, was there ever a moment early on in the show where you doubted it would have strong nuanced themes you could discuss? The only time I had anything resembling fears of this nature were before the show began. There were a lot of comments, as you pointed out, talking about how this was just a shonen, right? But this show gripped me pretty quickly. I think it does a great job revealing early on that it has a lot of heart. And that's largely thanks to the Deku All Might dynamic, which I think is partly why I still gravitate so strongly to nostalgia over the first season. Maybe in the first couple moments of the show, but no, it, it grabbed me real fast. Inez DS asks, how do you think Deku will be better than All Might's generation at fixing the broken elements of this hero system? I think a large part of the All Might system is this sort of everyone looks up structure where we are placing all of our faith and all of our opinions even to a large extent in the structures that be. And that works out really well when you have someone like All Might, but doesn't work out when you have someone else who navigated their way to the top. And there's a real parallel for that in society where like, you know, this leader is gonna save our whole lives or this leader is gonna bring about the end of the world. If it's really like that, then it's over because it's just a matter of time before the wrong person ends up in power, right? I think what's stronger than that is placing a priority on each of the individual units that comprise the society being a source of strength themselves. That ends up creating a whole that's stronger than the sum of its parts. And so I have a feeling Deku's system will, one, be a little bit freer. It won't be so rigid in terms of its hierarchy, which might mean doing away with the, the hero ranking system and this concept of like number one hero, at least to a certain extent. And will be more about sort of a collection of, of people who are great, like class 1A as a whole. And also where we're not so quick to sort of put people in these binary categories of hero and villain, where there's some sympathy given to people who have a rough time for reasons that are not their choice. You know, like look at the togas of the world and you know, I've heard in the manga there's a guy who has to vent gas or else he dies. Even though it's difficult, there needs to be more attention paid to the individual. And I think that this is a group of people who are willing to take on big challenges. So maybe Deku can be that person. When he asks his favorite theme of the story thus far, this is hard. There's so many good ones. It's your quirk, not his is a great one. You know, it comes up in a lot of shows where the answer is not necessarily rejecting your past. There's this trap where you think the discarding of everything that made you is freedom. But that's a trap in a different way. There's perhaps a truer freedom in taking all those elements and harmonizing them and being sort of an amalgamation of how you got here with who you actually are and who you want to be. I think that this is being built and will continue to be built in Todoroki, who will ultimately have power in, in both sides, you know, both fire and ice being at full power, but also them being more powerful in combination. I also like this idea that pretty much all the characters have of maximal responsibility. Like, man, here's this thing that didn't go the way I wanted it to go. What am I going to do differently? You know, how am I going to rise to the challenge? And where am I going to draw the energy from? I feel like it's so important. It might seem simple, but I feel like increasingly I'm I'm being bombarded with images about how everything is not my fault and that there's this villain class of people who are responsible for the ills of my life. And it's this group or that group that's destroying society. It, it, for me, it's like, I'd rather just drown that all out. And what am, what am I going to be today? And what am I going to do today? That is such a more resilient and interesting question to me. And I think that's how the heroes operate. And then which of the villain's quirks would you want? I think twice would be the most fun. There's a lot I could do with that. And I would also enjoy intelligent conversation. <laughs> Steve of the Weaver asks a hard hitting question. Why do you think YoTube changed to YapTube? It was for me because I think YapTube is much more hilarious. I enjoyed talking about the pitfalls of YapTube in that arc. Dual Pierce asks how I would Aang rank if he worked in the world of MHA as a hero. Aang would be a great addition to class 1A. This is really intriguing <laughs> thinking about this. That's an alternate life for Aang that I think he would really enjoy. You know, he would love to be in this class and like be able to be the prankster and the, you know, the footloose guy. The question for me about Aang and that environment though is what would be the journey for him that matured him you know he was sort of thrown into the deep end and was in many ways shaped by that hardship mha is so much fun <laughs> i would put him top 20 and the only reason i'm not putting him higher is because i feel like without something forcing him to really commit himself he could easily fall into being a little bit leisurely, perhaps, in regards to his education. Oak asks, on the top 10 heroes list, there are many we don't know about. Who would you want to get more focus on? Washing Machine Man. How did Washing Machine make it to the top 10? What does he do exactly? It's such a competitive world. The fact that this Washing Machine dude is that high is really intriguing. Anya McGee asks, could I ever hope to be someone like you? Not exactly a MHA question, but I will say that I hope you could be better than me. <laughs> Forgive me for being cheesy, but I honestly think this is true. You can never be me but you wouldn't want to be like the path towards what you're looking for in that question is not me it's whatever you are if that makes sense and i think that's sort of the journey that we're all on is trying to find out what that means exactly gabrielle avalar asks who is the hardest to watch <laughs> 
Nina and her dog from FMAB, or Shigaraki and his Corgi. Yes. Dreams of Caffeine asks, what kind of team-ups would you like to see moving forward? I think I got a taste of what I was looking for in the Heroes Rising movie. I loved how they used all the, the class 1A students in conjunction with each other. As cool as that was, I feel like it barely scratched the surface. There's so much more they could do with that. There's so much potential. For example, Aizawa and Gun. <laughs> Aizawa and Gun, deadly. Deadly combination. Nicholas Moglin asks, having Bakugo or Manama as a brother? Ooh. <laughs> Do I gotta live with them? I'm gonna go with Monoma. He's intense, but it's a different kind of intensity. It's not direct aggression and vitriol. It's like passion. Also, I'd rather not be exploded. Samian Von Braun asks, Do you think things would have been better if All Might retired earlier? I think he retired at exactly the right time. I would not trade that all for one All Might United States of Smash battle for anything. And I love that he was able to have that conclusive end publicly in a way that gave people hope while also concretely passing the torch. You know, something really beautiful about that. But then again, there's also the concern for him. And while it worked out, ultimately, I think, I have some pity and also some dismay for the fact that he took that all upon himself for so long. Anthony Dorado asks All Might versus AFO or Endeavor versus the high end. I'm going to go All Might versus All for One just because All for One was better established and I think it meant more. The Endeavor moment at the end was incredible and is up there with that All Might moment, but I didn't really have any connection to the Nomu, so it was sort of just like Endeavor on exhibition mode, if that makes sense. The dude asks, do you enjoy the filler parts of MHA and what do you think about the pacing overall in the last two seasons? In my understanding, there were only two episodes that were added to the show that were not in the original manga, and those were both the Selkie episodes. <laughs> those were definitely not my favorite episodes, but they were not bad. I mean, they were enjoyable in the right, especially the first one I'd say with Sue. I was sort of grateful for that, that Sue focus. And also, in a weird way, even though this wasn't the direct focus of the episode, it was, I think, the first time I posed the question, what is it like for people who are born with quirks that make them look like animals? Because those squid dudes did not seem happy. But looking not at those episodes, but at the sort of slice of life stuff, that's some of my favorite parts of the show. As great as the action is, and as triumphant as some other journeys are, I think a lot of the warmth shines through in those moments. Because I like the characters and I've gotten to know them, I like seeing them interact. And so it's nice to see them have moments where they're enjoying themselves and being good kids, you know, I don't know. Like we had that whole thing in season four, that whole concert. And yeah, there was a villain in that arc, but I mean, in a weird way, there almost needn't have been. As much as I like Gentle Criminal, it was rewarding in itself just to see them put that together and to see their different strengths shine and to do that for Eri. You know what I mean? I wouldn't have traded that for anything. If I had to complain about something like this, it wouldn't be filler and it wouldn't be slice of life. It would be recaps. The recaps were the most difficult things to get through, you know? We live in a superhero society, you know, it's like, come on, we've seen it. <laughs> we we know, it's like called Minecraft Academia. Those were the only episodes for me that were tough to like really get juice out of. As far as pacing, I did not notice any decline except for maybe one or two moments. What comes to mind is the early part of the class 1A versus class 1B training exercise where some of the early fights again, were enjoyable, but didn't have sort of the same weight or gravity that a lot of other episodes in the season did. It's inevitable. You know, it's a show that is over 100 episodes and is trying to do a lot, and it's never not fun. You know, it's never not enjoyable. It's just sort of the degree to which it's true. Felix the Cat asks, if you were enrolled at UA as a teacher, what kind of class would you teach? Well, given my history, probably English. <laughs> and I think I would do a lot better than present Mike at that and at much lower volume. It's funny, but also terrifying to think about. You know, my mom always says, wherever you go, there you are. It's so true. You can't escape from yourself. Like, there's a lot of overlap between the way I do videos and the way I teach. In class, I will gladly go down any possible conversational rabbit hole I could extract out of the class. Just anything to escape the tedium, anything to form a connection, anything to give actual context to what we're doing. But assuming I'm Japanese, I might teach something in the business class because I have a background in that. I have a background in finance and I actually taught a principles of investing class in China because at the last school I taught at, we had an elective slot where we could sort of like make whatever class we wanted and students could sign up and I did investing. Reggie Gugas, do you think My Hero Academia gets a lot of unnecessary hate or is it overrated? I don't really know because my experience with the show exists almost entirely through YouTube and Patreon. And so there's sort of a selection bias there where the people who are watching it are probably people who like it. The only time I noticed anything like this, as I mentioned previously, is when this show was on the polls, when it was leading the polls on Patreon. And a lot of the things I heard about it were that it was sort of basic and there wasn't a lot there. That I think is probably just the baggage that Shonen carries. And Shonen has a lot of baggage. And MJ suffers from that baggage to some degree. It's just that there's so many other shiny elements to it that you forgive the baggage. You take any popular thing and you're gonna find a lot of love for that thing. And it's not gonna be an accident, right? It's gonna to be because people are finding something there that they value. And also you're going to find a lot of hate. And, you know, part of that is going to be because of genuine criticisms that 
you know, maybe are particular to people's tastes, but also some of that is going to be kind of a contrarianism where perhaps people feel like a show being ranked highly detracts from something else that they're ranking more highly in their mind. And somehow that becomes emotionally interwoven and personal where it needn't be. I think just speaking very generally that when you find instances of extreme hate, especially when people haven't taken the time to explore something fully, it's probably an instance of something emotional being triggered for one reason or another. You know, they have an attachment to certain things. Travis J asks, is there anything specific you think separates the show from other action anime? I would say the depth at which it goes for the heart. Other shows sort of dance around a lot of these ideas. Like they're there and we all know them and they become cliches like the power of friendship and doing your best and not giving up and being a good person and helping others. You know, it's all obvious. But what this show does so well is blasting beyond the cliche and making it deeply believable. And I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think it's because the show actually has real insight on what those things are, what they mean and why they're valuable. It's not just token slogans that have lost grounding to the actual beauty. You know, it is the real beauty, or at least it gets very, very close to it. And I would say it has that in common with many of the other shows I've watched on the channel. You know, like Avatar is an example of that. And Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. A lot of the things in that show run pretty neatly along the standard conventional lines, except with way more depth. The characters are living, breathing people, and we go to all the extremes of their personal journeys and the testing of their ideologies to a point where it's not just hollow ideas sort of reflected through a prism. It's like, this is, this is it. You know, this is what heroism is, you know, or this is really what goodness is. This is what friendship is. You know what I mean? Nathaniel Wanner asks, was there a character that while watching you didn't really like at all? I think I mentioned that one character that rubs me the wrong way is Baby's Girl. She creeps me right the hell out. I would also say that at times I got a little bit tired of Midnight. I mean, it was, it's a lot. You could ask, well, if you're tired of Midnight Stick, why are you not tired of Mineta? And the answer is I am tired of Mineta's stick, but I also really thought it was a brave and not really talked about choice to have his backstory be like heartbreak in romance. That actually is one of the most believable backstories for me. Then I would say, this is not a negative, but sort of like a, what is your function, magic man? in the League of Villains. I feel like in a crew of people who have really distinct and interesting personalities, he's sort of there, just there. Oh, and for a brief time, Night Eye, but that changed. And who was your favorite character that didn't get much screen time? Can I say Mirio? <laughs> Again, not enough. I would watch a spinoff of Mirio, let's put it that way. Aside from that, I would say that at least in later seasons, Ida sort of falls by the wayside a bit, and I really love Ida. I, I felt his absence. Juan Carlos asks, would you prefer to accept the drink invitation that Aizawa offers All Might, or teacup invitation from Iroh? It's funny that this question comes up in in so many q a's <laughs> the iro choice this time i'm gonna go with iro just because hanging out with aizawa would be great but tea with iro is an extra thing it's tea with iro this is a man who loves his tea you're getting iro one of the greatest characters that ever lived in my heart in his element i think you can't pass that up and if the show had a different protagonist or successor from all for one who would you pick? People who I think would be solid candidates are Kirishima, Uraraka, that comes to mind. I think because she has a similar purity. And also it turns out a deadly quirk. Sue would be interesting. And she has the emotional maturity to handle that. Todoroki and Bakugo both could work after they've gone through some other stuff. Like I think at this point, they would both be good candidates, but not at the beginning of the show, because I think in order to do one for all successfully, there needs to be sort of minimal baggage. Deku's main point of baggage was not being a hero, which receiving one for all solved. So he was sort of free to pour his entire energy into that. Amaze Atsuma asks, how concerned are you that Hawks delivered what appears to be the body of best genius? It didn't happen. It didn't. He's alive. He's fine. And I know he's fine because I refuse to believe it. And also because Bakugo needs to have that closure with his name. My question is more like, what was that that we saw? Who was that? Do you think the events of All Might's death will come as Night Eye foresaw? I sort of want to believe that they changed fate. There's this idea I saw quite commonly in season four that Ares' reversal sort of altered the tide that Night Eye can see. But that doesn't really seem to hold for me because assuming that I actually is seeing the future and that the future is a link of cause and effect, wouldn't Ares' action just be part of that causal link and therefore be a part of Night prediction? You know what I mean? It's more satisfying for me, and this is just the way I think, to think of it thematically and to think that it was just another challenge that they overcame, that their faith and will was so powerful that they cannot even be beaten by fate itself. You know, there's something really cool about that idea for me, but it remains to be seen, and with the villains sort of gearing up and being more powerful than ever, it's a very real possibility. Hirokoshi recently stated the manga will end this year. I didn't know that. Is that real? Is it really ending, the story? That actually is really exciting because that makes me think that this is happening. The Deku Shigaraki thing is happening. And I think that is where it's going. I think that that's been being built from the beginning. You know, you have the Deku arc on this side and the Shigaraki arc on this side and it's going to come head to head and it's going to be amazing. And I think the story ends with Shigaraki not being redeemed necessarily, but changing 
and being saved at least in some way, although I can't quite say what that is. Deku sort of coming into his own and joining together the legacy of the past that rests on his shoulders with what is something more in his own image that I think will incorporate the group as a whole and will sort of move society forward one, one step ahead. How do you feel about the female characters in the show and who's your favorite female character? So actually, I think that the female characters are, are written well. I just think that they perhaps don't have enough screen time. Like, for example, I really resonated with Uraraka's backstory as somebody who wants to help my parents, you know? Also, I love Sue. In fact, I think I mentioned both of them in my list of top 10 favorite characters. And there are a lot of other really good examples. I just think they don't get the same amount of screen time. Christian Glass, can you rank all the shows you've watched on this channel? This is tough. I'd say instead of giving like a objective numerical ranking, I think what is closer to the way I think about it is sort of like what is in the top tier. And for me, the top tier right now is Avatar, both Airbender and Korra, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Attack on Titan, My Hero Academia, and First Basket. So basically all of them, or almost all of them. What was your expectations in the beginning of the series? So I didn't know what to expect except for heroes, and I think based on the character designs that I was already familiar with, I thought the show would be a lot more silly. But what surprised me about it is the depth and the heart. And it's actually, you know, there are moments of silliness, but it's not really that tone at all. It's actually quite heavy. Then as Feklistov asks, how do you feel about Midoriya's current state, and do you think he can remain interesting in light of his consistency? This is something I thought about. Deku did so much growth so quickly and is already at this point of being this amazing hero even though he's still in his first year of high school. What is going to be the growth going forward? And I think one key thing that, that still needs to happen is a key element you find in a lot of hero stories where they have to take the legacy that's been handed them and honor that while also making it authentic. And I feel like Deku hasn't really come across anything that's challenged the latter aspect of that. Meaning right now who he is and who he wants to be is very well matched with what society expects of him. But I think one potential point of development for him is what happens when his values and who he is clash with expectations, clash with maybe the rules or what other people expect him to do when he doesn't want to do it, or when there's immense pressure to be counter his own, his own nature. Who does he become in that moment? And does he refine his ideals further towards what he is? That I think would be an interesting thing to explore for Deku. Think about Aang, right? Who like has all the pressures of the Avatar, but also is this sweet kid who is not interested in killing. And Zuko for that matter as well. Ray Gunga asks, what character do you want to have more development? I want Mineta to have a moment. I wanted to mature and grow up and to become an actual hero. I think that would be such a satisfying thing from like this hated character who's really inappropriate and has some of the worst moments of the show character wise to someone who actually is like great. You know, that would be really rewarding for me. Waffinator asks, general impressions of season five. So I'd heard a lot of controversy about season five before watching it, but for most of the points I heard about it, I don't think they would have come to mind if I had just watched. There's the order of events that's different from the manga, but I don't have that, that sort of baseline. And also I think it was in many ways a good choice leaving off with the My Villain academia arc just because of the tension that creates for season six but also i heard a lot of criticisms about the overall style and animation perhaps but to be perfectly honest it's just not my lens like i'm not a very visual person and i feel like i would enjoy the stories just as much if they were stick figures because that's really what i'm looking for i'm looking for characters growth and what i can take from it that makes me think differently or think better or feel better or whatever and so it didn't come to mind as i was watching i didn't think about how oh, this is inferior to prior seasons it may have been it's just not what i look for so overall i really enjoyed season five the only criticism i would have of it as i mentioned are some of the episodes in the 1b 1a classroom exercise arc felt a little bit unfair to me if that's the right word maybe because i'm just a 1a fanboy trey goldworthy asks what did you think of the english voice acting i actually loved it you know like typically i'm a sub watcher but because of the channel and the format i prefer to watch dub it just makes it a way way easier for me to watch and edit but i think the voice cast for the most part knocks it out of the park i actually had the experience occasionally of going back and watching it in Japanese. Just, you know, when I'm making thumbnails, I don't bother to change the language. And a bunch of times it stood out to me how much I preferred the, the English dub. I think especially for comedy. I think that's one thing that is an advantage of watching dub over sub, where if you have a direct understanding of the language, the humor sort of lands better. And specifically Mineta. Mineta's voice actor is hilarious. The, the line delivery, I think, is outstanding. Like, I literally cracked up at some of Mineta's lines that I didn't have that same feeling for in the, the original. Gay Ninja asks, as I'm sure you already know, the heroes are going to fight the paranormal liberation front. What do you think the outcome will be of this battle? I think casualties are inevitable, unfortunately, on both sides. I think it's a safe bet that the heroes are victorious, but at a huge cost and at a cost that makes them evaluate, reevaluate their stance on a lot of things and maybe even incorporate some of the villain's points. And maybe that leads to a shift and, and a next arc. Or another possibility is that if there's enough time for this, there's a greater threat that emerges. This is not necessarily in season six, but later. Perhaps the singularity thing, the quirk singularity that sort of takes priority and sees them banding together. I think that's that's a possibility. And Zachariah Tariq asks, how would you say MHA differs from DC Marvel? I would say one thing I find really refreshing about My Hero Academia in comparison to 
the direction I feel a lot of Western hero stuff has gone is that it resists this common urge to confuse darkness with maturity and broodingness with maturity you know i feel like a lot of heroes in the west have sort of become edgy and that edginess is supposed to be a sign of value in a way or that they have a major character flaw and that somehow makes them more compelling i think there's room for that but personally what i want in a hero story is for people i want to become like i want to not be brooding i want to not have character flaws i want to be the best that i can be as cliche as that might sound so i want these like golden idols you know i want people who are not perfect necessarily i think that would be a mistake too but constantly are aiming for better constantly are pushing themselves in ways that are inspiring and you know are actually pure of heart i like that in characters i think one thing marvel does really well is there's a light-heartedness there it doesn't take itself too seriously but i think my academia is one beyond that because it has that lightheartedness, but also it has real, real emotional depth. It's not about the one-liners or the references to other things. I mean, in the Marvel movies, there are definitely moments of greatness, but I feel like My Hero Academia delivers it a little bit more consistently and is a little bit more self-aware in terms of what those qualities are. And Miguel asks, how much, if any, in real life beach training have you done? I did some. I live on an island and I actually made that end screen for a little while. All right, and with that, that is the end of the My Hero Academia Q&A. That was a lot of talking about My Hero Academia. Thank you guys so much for the questions. I apologize if I didn't get to your question. The good news, thankfully, is this is not the end. This is just a little break in My Hero Academia. For those of you who have followed the series, thank you again, and I'll see you, if not for the new shows coming up, then definitely for season six of My Hero Academia in the fall. Bye.